open them, if you will, to Revelation chapter 9. So I'm going to share screen, and then here we go. Revelation 9, the five months of torment. Um, feels like we've all been going through, what, 12 months of torment as we've gone through COVID, and it's still going. But uh, five months of torment, unlike the world we'll ever see, uh, will begin to unfold as we look into this chapter of Revelation. Our uh, society is fascinated with uh, end time scenarios. They're fascinated by things that are like, um, you know, tribulation level disaster. The, the one thing that keeps showing up over and over and over that I'll show you here in a slide that, that many people in our church are into some of these things, but zombie films, zombie TV shows, uh, we have a proliferation and a fascination as Americans with, with zombies. What gets people with these films is, is to have like the world shutting down in a way where everyone's going off the grid and having to survive. And so what's happened with the proliferation of these films is you have people that are, that are trying to prep for whatever disaster they fear is coming. There are those in this day and age that fear that we're heading into a recession or a collapse, kind of like what happened in the 1920s. We're gonna have a roaring 20s that will end in another financial uh, great depression. And so you're, you're beginning to kind of read about these things where people are getting more fearful of a society collapsing either financially or, uh, you know, we've seen a bit of that this year, didn't we? When, when there was a run on toilet paper and there was a run on certain things at the store, people were beginning to think, oh man, this is the end. This is what it's gonna be like. What you also have happening is you, you have a lot of depression. Under COVID, you've had a lot of depression happen. But as we go into the chapter we're gonna go into tonight, we, we are gonna see that people are going to be in such a bad situation, they're going to wish for death and won't be able to get it. Well, let me read what's here. I wish I could die. That's a hyperbolic statement that we carelessly and thoughtlessly toss about when we are angry, hurt, or disappointed. If we ever drive on I-4, I've heard people say such things. Man, uh, I hate this road. Uh, we, we don't really mean it when we say it. It simply expresses our strong feelings um, and our emotions at a situation or circumstance we are not happy about that we wish were different. However, there is coming a day when men will say, I wish I could die, and they will mean it. But amazingly, they will not be able to find it, though they seek it with all of their heart. Imagine that, if you would, a day when men will desire death more than life, when they will desire death even more than they desire God. When, you might ask, will that be? Well, the answer we're going to study tonight is when demons arise from the abyss and armies come from the east, when the fifth angel sounds his trumpet in Revelation chapter 9. This chapter divides evenly into two parts. The fifth trumpet comprises verses 1 through 12 and signals the demons from the abyss. The sixth trumpet is detailed in verses 13 through 21. It records the coming of an army of 200 million. John names the, the their numbers, the, the exact number, as well as humanity's steadfast refusal to repent of its sin. Uh, a little pause there. We're seeing more and more of a stubbornness of people, no matter what unfolds, to really and truly repent of sin and turn to God. Everybody believed that when 9-11 happened, there was going to be a huge influx into the churches. And for one week there was, but two weeks later, it was back to normal numbers nationally. And so the, the willingness to repent and to stick and continue is lacking in this nation. In all that is recorded, the absolute and awesome sovereignty of God is on full display. As we read Revelation 9, God is always in control. Even demons will do his bidding, and he remains uh, sinless. He just allows them to do uh, what they do. What is in particular, um, God would want us to learn from this frightening chapter. We're going we're gonna to study it. Chapter 6 contained the sealed judgments and introduces to the four horsemen of the apocalypse, where one-fourth of humanity is killed. Last week, we were looking at a third of the earth getting destroyed, and uh, tonight we're going to be looking at a third of the remaining humanity getting killed. So you have the seals that we've already worked through. We're in the fourth and fifth uh, judgment, trumpet judgment here in the middle. So we're square uh, towards the, the right now, uh, over the hump of the judgments, uh, and then we'll go into the bold judgments uh, soon. And here's another image. We're on trumpets five and six tonight. And so let's read the text. Let's dive in to the word of God. The fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth. The key for the shaft to the abyss was given to him. He opened the shaft to the abyss, and smoke came up out of the shaft like smoke from a great furnace. 
so that the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke from the shaft. Then locusts came out of the smoke onto the earth, and power was given to them like the power that scorpions have on the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth, nor any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have God's seal on their foreheads. They were not permitted to kill them, but were to torment them for five months. Their torment is like the torment caused by a scorpion when it stings someone. In those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. The appearance of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. Something like golden crowns was on their heads. Their faces were like human faces. They, they had hair like women's hair. Their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had chests like iron breastplates. The sound of their wings was like the sound of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. And they had tails with stingers like scorpions. So that with their tails, they had the power to harm people for five months. They had as their king, the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon. And in Greek, he has the name Apollyon. The first woe has passed. There are still two more woes to come after this. The sixth angel, we're now in the, the, the sixth angel blow, uh, blew his trumpet from the four horns of the golden altar that is before God. I heard a voice say to the sixth angel who had the trumpet release the four angels bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who were prepared for the hour, day, month, and year were released to kill a third of the human race. The number of mounted troops was 200 million. I heard their number. This is how I saw the horses and their riders in the vision. They had breastplates that were fiery red, uh, hyacinth blue and sulfur yellow. The, the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions and from their mouths came fire, smoke and sulfur. A third of the human race was killed by these three plagues by the fire, the smoke, and the sulfur that came from their mouths. For the, the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails because their tails, which resemble snakes, have heads that inflict injury. The rest of the people who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands to stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, which cannot see, hear, or walk. And they did not repent of their murders, their sorceries, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. And thus completes the reading of God's inspired and inerrant word. As we uh, look at these uh, verses in detail here, John only needed six verses to set forth the first four trumpets of chapter four. Now he devotes an entire chapter, 21 verses, to trumpets five and six, the first and the second woes. Demonic activity will dominate the plagues and judgments associated with both trumpet five and trumpet six. Demons are certainly alive and active in our day. Jesus believed and taught their existence. Amazingly, most professing Christians are out of step with the Son of God on this. A recent Barna survey found that only 27% of professing Christians believe Satan to be real. I, I have a hard time grasping that, but uh, according to Barna, you know. But the Bible teaches that they are real and that they will be on a rampage when the great tribulation arrives. And so if we'll dive into the verses, the outline will come here in a bit. I really want us to study a bit of this angel that had fallen. Uh, the fifth angel blew his trumpet and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth. So the fifth angel sounds and John sees a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth. Had fallen is a perfect tense uh, participle emphasizing an event in past time with continuing results. This star, unlike the star of Revelation 8.10, is a person. So note the personal pronouns applied throughout our passage to this star. The statement is reminiscent of Luke 10.18, where Jesus said, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. A strong interpretation of, of the meaning of this star is to see this as a reference to Satan himself is neither a good angel nor a chief demon under the devil's direction, but tonight I'll be building the case. It is Satan, the devil himself, who is in view in this passage. Uh, he had fallen. It had already occurred prior to the blowing of the fifth trumpet. Lucifer is the star of the morning, the, the son of dawn. 
if you take the references of Isaiah and Ezekiel to uh, you know, speak of him symbolically, he's the anointed cherub in Ezekiel 28, 14, that, that many scholars think is a echo to Satan. He was cast out of God's presence and heaven's glory when sin was found in his heart. And he was given the key, the key for the shaft to the abyss was given to him. And so now as we move towards history's climax, he is allowed a diabolical freedom that he was previously denied. He's given a key to release a horde of what we believe to be demons. Let's talk about the key. The key always means authority in Revelation and then apocalyptic literature. He's given the key to the bottomless pit, the abyss. It's mentioned nine times in the New Testament. It's referred to as, as a type of prison house for demons. You have Luke 8, 31, 2 Peter 2, 4, and Jude 6 that you may want to look up and research. Also, the abode of the dead, mentioned in Romans 10, verse 7. This key to this abyss is given to him, and he opens it. We see where smoke comes out of, of the shaft like a smoke from a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke from the shaft. Immediately, he opens it, and smoke, dark and hot, fills the air and begins to darken the sun. And so we see that uh, unfolding here before us. The beast, we believe, the Antichrist will arise from the abyss, uh, and that, that comes later. Satan will be imprisoned there for a thousand years following the second coming of Jesus. And so his fall to the earth is great indeed from where he was. Um, it says here they had as their king, the angel of the abyss, his name in Hebrew is Abaddon. I'm, I'm jumping ahead here to verse 11. And I want to I zoom in on, um, you have the connection there to the abyss again, right? And then it connects now and tells us who this star is. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon. And in Greek, he has the name Apollyon. And so the king, again, is a reference to Satan, who is over the abyss. This is the uh, leader over the abyss. Look at the names again. In Hebrew, Abaddon just means destruction. And the Greek counterpart to that, Apollyon, means destroyer. And so the Hebrew word Abaddon appears six times in the Old Testament. It is derived from a verb that can mean to become lost, to perish, or to destroy or kill. We believe that to destroy or kill is the best interpretation of Abaddon in this context. Abaddon has similar meaning to Hades, as used in Revelation 1.18 or 6.8. A similar usage is found in Psalm 18.11, where it is paralleled with the grave, where you can read about Hades all throughout the Old Testament. Job 31.12 used the word to imply an unquenchable appetite of, uh, of the grave or of Abaddon. There, Abaddon is not only a place, but also a person. The personification of Abaddon lies behind its choice as a name for the angel of the underworld and king of the locusts in Revelation 9:11. Though Abaddon is under God's sovereign power, it has an insatiable appetite and represents not only a destruction that takes life, but a destruction that reaches beyond the grave to the afterlife. And so as we still study this, uh, if you know what Qumran material is, this is the Dead Sea Scroll area where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, around Israel. Uh, there's been more, as they've unearthed things, they found a lot of extra books and writings there. Uh, none of it of a level of scripture, but there's still some interesting things there that uh, might provide commentary. So some of that material demonstrates that the role of the angel of the abyss is like that of Belial, mentioned 33 times in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Described about 27 times in the Old Testament as a worthless, good-for-nothing base counselor of ruin. He was the military leader of the forces of darkness who was allowed to be unleashed against Israel. Belial terrorized the sons of the covenant, though not frequent. The word Abaddon is found in later rabbinic literature and came to stand for the place of the wicked dead. Abaddon would have conjured images of doom and despair for John's readers it would have made even more fearful the torture coming at the hand of the angel of the underworld and his army of destroyers. Let's look at the word Apollyon here. Uh, this is the Greek counterpart to Abaddon, as John tells us. It's used as a proper name only here in the Bible. The word is actually a present active participle, meaning the one who destroys. Something more subtle, however, may have been in John's use of Apollyon to translate Abaddon. Let's look at that subtlety for a moment, and then we'll jump back into the text. John may have subtly uh, intended an indirect attack on the Greek Roman god Apollo, and thus on the reigning emperor, Domitian, who thought of himself as Apollo incarnate. And Apollyon and Apollo look and sound very alike in Greek. Furthermore, worshipers of Apollo had as one of their symbols for him 
the locust. And so some interpreters believe this could just be a, a symbol um, you know, that John's using for his own day. In John's drama, the Greek reader could not have missed the echo of the name Apollo, the god, and Apollyon, the destroyer, the well-known pagan god, favorite of the emperor, whose persecution of Christians lies behind the revelation, is identified with hell and destruction. And so I think in some way, the message uh, had quite a bit for those in the first century, as it does for us today. Well, let's get into the outline. As we survey the fifth and sixth trumpet judgments, you need to consider the locusts. You got to look at the locusts and really study them. So let's look at these locusts in verse three. Then the locusts came out of the smoke onto the earth, and power was given to them like the power that scorpions have on the earth. And so demons mean humans nothing but harm, pain, and suffering. They delight in disease, disaster, and death. And never is this more evident than in this text that we're looking at tonight. And so I'm going to make a case that these are demons, um, but I will show you some other popular interpretations you may have heard if you have studied these things. When the shaft of the abyss is open, demons in the form of locusts flood the earth. Power and authority is given to them like scorpions. Uh, and then we see the locust came out of the smoke of the earth. This is reminiscent of the locust vision of Joel uh, 1, 6 and 2. These are not literal locusts. However, these are demons driven to torment mankind spiritually, physically, and in every other way as well. They were told not to arm the grass of the earth, but only those, who's, those people who do not have God's seal on their foreheads. So their mission is very clear to torment all persons who don't have the seal of God on their foreheads. Uh, so every Christian in this day will not be tormented by these demons. Believers will not be touched by these ambassadors from hell, but there is a limitation to what they can do. They can torment people, but they cannot kill. And so we see that they were not permitted to kill uh, those on the earth, but were to torment them for five months. And so the normal lifespan of a locust was approximately May through September. That is five months. And we learn, of course, their torment is like the torment caused by a scorpion when it stings someone. This verse would also seem to indicate the torment they inflict is primarily physical, stinging and striking like that of a scorpion. And so while death will be the lot of the Christian martyrs at the hands of evil men, these same evil men will seek and look for the same fate that they inflict on others, but they will not be able to find it. They will long and yearn for death, but they will, it will run from them and they will be unable to catch it. We see that in this passage here. If you look at the top in those days, people will seek death. They will not be able to find it. They will long to die. But death will flee from them. What a miserable, miserable existence. For thousands of years, men have run from the grim reaper only to find him too swift to evade. Now men chase him, but they find they are too slow afoot. And what an irony we see here. What a tragedy. Demon possession possibly might prevent their suicide for a time. Well, let's look at their appearance. Their appearance of locusts was like horses prepared for battle. Something like golden crowns was on their heads. Their faces were like human faces. I want to pause and just say whenever John is using the phrase like or something like, he's trying his best to put into his vocabulary what he's seeing. And so, you know, there have been a lot of theories as to what he may have been seeing. These verses provide a detailed description of these demons who have been confined perhaps in Satan's fall. But I want to encourage, we need to look at the big brush stroke here rather than zoom in as, you know, as best we can. And so here's the sentence. John is probably more concerned with the overall impression made by this vision than he is with the details. And so let's study the details, though. So without pressing the particulars beyond reason, we learn something about these maniacal monsters from the pit. The composite picture is that of a natural and uninhibited evil and wickedness. And so let's look at them here. The appearance of locusts was like horses prepared for battle. So they are an army prepared to wage war against God and his people, uh, though they can't harm any of um, you know, God's people that are sealed further. They are of considerable size and hence terrifying in appearance. Uh, we read about them that they have golden crowns on their heads. Their faces were like human faces. Crowns always means authority and power. So they have been granted power. And the human faces, there's some, some mystery on this, but it can mean intelligence. They are cunning and cruel, wise and wicked. There is a method to their madness. Uh, so they have a leader and they, they follow a very well orchestrated game plan for five months. They had hair like women's hair. Um, yeah, good luck looking at this. 
Perhaps it's an indication of the long antenna of the locusts or to the seductiveness of their strategies. I mean, no one knows. Uh, lion's teeth, uh, that means definitely a fierceness and death-like power in their attack. Um, but look at this, they had chests like iron breastplates. The breastplates of iron here, virtually invulnerable. They are strong and well-protected. It would take a supernatural power greater than their own to defeat these locusts. Um, so, I mean, who knows what in the world these things are really in reality going to look like as, we, as we're as we straining to see that. The sound of their wings here says that they are intimidating and they're coming. They sound like a bunch of chariots with horses rushing in the battle. That was always a very terrifying sound if you were at war, especially if you didn't have chariots and your opponent did. The sound of their attack and approach would strike fear in the heart of any opponent who attempted to oppose them. And they had tails with stingers like scorpions. And so they possess some type of painful sting that causes great agony and great suffering. So what I wanna do here in a moment is I wanna show you some artist depictions and then also some other theories that, that people have come up with. Here's one of the oldest ones uh, that I was able to find, one of the earliest depictions of this in Christian art. You have in the middle of the picture here, I think this is from the ninth or 10th century. I'll, I'll show you a descriptor slide here in a moment, but that's your locust there in the middle. You got those, those two kings with three kings there with uh, crowns. And those are the locusts, the horses looking creatures coming out of this abyss. You see the angel blowing the trumpet. You see like the, uh, that's the fifth angel. The sixth angel is, is behind them, I guess, or maybe that's Jesus on the left with the, the halo. That looks maybe like, like that could be the Lord. And uh, you, you've got, you know, this leader leading them out of the abyss there. That's the devil there on the right side of your screen with the horses that have like a, a human face. Uh, let's look at this. Should the reader of Revelation understand these judgments as literal or symbolic? The illuminator of the ninth chapter of Revelation in the 13th century AD manuscript. So this is the 13th century, uh, known as the Dyson Perrin's Apocalypse. He chose to interpret the text very literally as seen by his artwork. The locust scorpion creatures have human faces with women's hair. They wear crowns and they have bodies like battle horses with stinger tails. So I don't know if I saw the stinger tail there, um, but uh, maybe, yeah, I don't know if, if it's somewhere in there. Uh, let's look at some other depictions. This is aliens. These are the xenomorphs, if you've ever seen the alien films. There are some that have suggested they're going to look similar to this. And this is a terrifying image uh, for anybody, I think, if you've ever seen Alien or Aliens. Here are some artist depictions of these guys. If you take the literal view, um, you've, got, you've got it all there. You've got a big locust there in the middle with a stinger tail and grabbing a human. And these things are huge and, and freaky looking. Look at this uh, beautiful creature here. You got a big uh, horse coming at you with the, uh, the face, the crown, the hair, the, the, all of it, and the stinger's tail. Uh, this is another depiction that we were able to locate. You got the breastplates of iron and uh, just, I mean, none of these look uh, very appealing. This was out of like a uh, man's art uh, comic book rendition of Revelation. And this is what he ended up drawing. Um, based on the description that John gives. Here's another image where you have kind of everything described there showing up. Um, but here's the other theory that someone's had. Somebody thought maybe John is giving us the best thing he can give us using his limited first century, um, you know, Greek. And, and so perhaps he did see something like to a helicopter. Because if you think about it, if you ever heard a helicopter flying around, it can sound like a horse galloping. Um, and so if you look at that, you got kind of all this stuff showing up here, the breastplates of iron, you got teeth of a lion here on this helicopter with an eye there, faces of men where you got a pilot in there. You got the, uh, the hair looking like women's hair where it's kind of thin there with the, uh, you know, the rotor going around, maybe a crown of gold with a crush mark, but the tail of a scorpion kind of holds where it kind of looks like a scorpion tail, you know, and maybe it's a chemical warfare that, that is sprayed on people that makes them sick for five months and, and it's, it's just miserable. Something like you may have had in the First World War. And you got the wings there with the sound of an army uh, of, of horse-drawn chariots. When you, when you kind of put a scorpion next to a helicopter, you can kind of see it. It's like, yeah, that kind of looks like a scorpion, you know? And so you have certain uh, readers over the years that have really read uh, and, and tried to take what John said here is that, I think they're demonic as I've studied the passage. 
If you take it literally, if it's more figurative, perhaps uh, it's something more along the lines of a helicopter. You also have shown here is a fig tree in full leaf. And that same fig tree stripped bare after the locust invasion on the right. We know these locusts are going to go around and destroy. And so also the agony that unbelievers face as God's judgment proceeds is likened to the sting of a scorpion when it strikes. And so this, the scorpion species that inhabit the Middle East produce some of the more deadly neurotoxic venoms. At the very least, a sting can cause a sharp burning pain at the wound site for several weeks. Um, I've, every time I've seen a scorpion, I've never enjoyed that encounter. It's always a creature. When I see it, it's like I want to kill this creature. Uh, let's go further into the text. So that with their tails, they had the power to harm people for five months. So you see them hurting for five months. This repeats verse five and adds emphasis and intensity to their mission of misery. The horror of this judgment is unspeakable. And yet the worst is yet to come. Verse 12 simply and straightforwardly says, the first woe is past, behold, take notice, look here, the, the sixth and seventh trumpets, the, the two woes are still coming after these things. The first disaster is past, the two more are on their way. And so as you keep moving through the passage, as we survey the fifth and sixth trumpet judgments, number one, consider the locust. Number two, let's comprehend the army. Let's look at the army. If Revelation teaches us anything, it teaches us that God is in control. He is Lord, he is sovereign. History has a purpose, and that purpose is God's purpose. History is following a plan, and that plan is God's plan. So when you look at verse 13, we have the sixth angel blew his trumpet. And from the four horns of the golden altar that is before God, I heard a voice. The sixth angel sounds an unspecified voice, speaks from the golden altar, which is before God. Possibly this is the angel priest of chapter 8, verses 3 through 5. He speaks to the sixth angel with a clear and precise word. From it, we learn an incredible lesson. So let's look at this. Uh, it says, say to the six angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels bound at the great river Euphrates. So as I've studied this, I know there may be a lot of diversity in our study tonight. Uh, a lot of the commentaries I read suggested strongly that these angels are likely demons. Good angels are never said to be bound. And the Euphrates marked to the east, the boundary separating Israel from her primary enemies. Um, and so possibly God prepared his, prepared his prepared plan is very clear here. They had been prepared in perfect tense for the hour, the day, the month, and the year. It says that right in the verse. So the four angels who were prepared for the hour, day, month, and year were released to kill a third of the human race. I would love to know, wouldn't you, what day, hour, and year, and month that is. Wouldn't that be great if we could just have that and be able to track backwards a bit and know what's coming and when it's going to show up somehow. This is a very precise time. There is also a precise purpose. Look, this is a big thing. You don't wanna, you don't wanna skip over this. We, we might need to pause in a moment of silence for what's about to unfold in future history here. here. Um, they were released to kill a third of the human race. I mean, that is unlike, I, I know the, the weight of despair I felt on 9-11, you know, when 3000 died, I can't imagine can't imagine what the earth is going to go through when a third of the human race is just killed. And so this is a precise time. There's a precise purpose to kill a third of mankind. It's unimaginable. Combined with Revelation chapter 6, verse 8, we discover that one half of the earth's population will die as a result of the seal and trumpet judgments. This carnage is unfathomable. This is already following a, a huge death of, of the human population. The number of mounted troops was 200 million. I heard their number. And so the 200 million army, demons or humans, question comes up. So far, everything tonight's come up demons. And either or decision may not be necessary or even best. Some connect the army with the kings of the east in 1612 in Revelation and identify them with the human army. And so you do have many that believe this will be China because it's an army from the east of 200 million. And it's interesting that at least when you look from Israel, what's east of Israel is uh, China. And interestingly, Time Magazine in 1965 noted that China then claimed an army, an army of 200 million people. I don't believe their, their army is even that large today, but I think if they called up all their active and inactive folks, yeah, they could probably easily hit 200 million uh, battle-ready um, you know, individuals. It's certainly possible, even reasonable, to believe demons will work through human instrumentality in this day. 
And so that's another uh, option. It's both. These are demon possessed uh, armies of humans that are coming to kill. But still, the primary description before us would appear to be that of additional demons. If you're going to take the very literal reading of what we're studying here, it, it looks more like it's demonic. And so the remarkable description of the horses and the riders would support this. To think of a world with 200 million additional demons is beyond human imagination. We don't exactly know the number today that's in the world, though, but 200 million more can't be good and isn't good as we see it in this chapter. Revelation 9, 17, this is how I saw the horses and the riders in the vision. I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna show you a few maybe descriptions that uh, artist depictions, and then I'll show you some ideas people have had with these verses. Only here in Revelation does John directly indicate the visionary nature of what he experienced. Again, the overall impression of the horses and the riders is more important than the details. So let's read the verse again. This is how I saw the horses and the riders in the vision. They had breastplates that were fiery red, high seanth blue, and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. From their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. John saw in the vision the following, the riders with breastplates of fire and high, high seanth, uh, I think I'm saying that in word right, correct me later, dark blue and of brimstone. Uh, you had sulfurous were uh, is described in the Greek there, the red, blue, and yellow of the protective breastplates matches the fire, smoke, and brimstone that comes out of the mouth of the horses in verse 18. The heads of the horses are like the heads of lions. It speaks of the ferocity, the cruelty, the destructive strength and power, the lion, is the apex in the, the jungle. And so these things are going to be unstoppable. So John describes the troops of death as riders on horses with heads like lions and tails like snakes. In Greek mythology, a fire breathing monster known as the chimera had the head and body of a lion, maybe it's chimera, um, and a serpent with a serpent for a tail and a goat head coming from its back. A chimera is depicted on this Greek drinking cup from Rhodes in about 500 BC. So it seems to be kind of a similar image of what John is describing here. And so you have some, some weird uh, connections here. There are some that just like they thought the locusts could represent uh, helicopters, that perhaps the, um, you know, the lions here with the breastplates of iron could be a tank. Maybe John saw a tank and he was just trying to describe in his limited Greek vocab what he was seeing. This is an Abrams take here that kind of looks like maybe a lion if, if you're not familiar with it. And, only uh, limited to your first century. And you have fire coming out of its mouth and, and the tail looking like a tail of a snake uh, with, with like a, you know, a human face or a head. It could be a tank, you know, that's, that's the idea that some have had. If you don't take the demonic approach, demonic army approach, it could be uh, something more uh, figurative there. This is an artist depiction, uh, old Christian literature here of, of what is seen here. You have a man riding a lion a horse with a lion's face, breathing fire. That's a very literal artist depiction of what we've studied. So the destructive forces of fire, smoke, and brimstone proceed from their mouths, and by these three plagues, one-third of mankind is killed. Verse 16 provides an additional descriptive word. There's also power in the horse's tails, for they are like serpents and have heads, and with them they do harm. And so again, maybe uh, something like you're seeing here, maybe where they have the little gun in the back. If you, if you want to take the tank interpretation, th those have been shared for quite some time. Um, with their mouths, they kill, and with their tails, they harm. From either direction or both ends, they have the capacity to damage and destroy. Such a description supports the view that these are demon hordes, which are causing havoc on the earth, or again, demon-possessed humans. All right, fire-breathing monsters were common in ancient mythology. Fire-breathing demons will be a reality, perhaps, during the Great Tribulation. One cannot help but think back to Genesis 19, when fire and brimstone rained on Sodom and Gomorrah. Then it affected two cities. In the future, much of the world will suffer. And so as we survey the fifth and sixth trumpet judgments, we want to finish out with the last two verses of our text here. You want to cast off all idols. Cast off all idols. Let's look at these final two verses. The rest of the people who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands to stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, which cannot see, hear, or walk. And they did not repent of their murderers, their sorceries, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. 
So I'm sorry to show you this. Hope this doesn't cause anyone to stumble. They were still worshiping idols. Shown here is one type of household statue that the Israelites adopted between the 8th and 7th centuries BC. It is a pottery piece with an exaggerated female form and is known as a pillar figurine. It may have functioned as an amulet to promote fertility and provide protection for mother and child during childbirth. These were forbidden uh, under the Old Testament covenant, under the law. And yet the Israelite homes uh, were given to idols in those years. Uh, the most tragic and terrifying reality of Revelation 9 is not the judgments of God. It's the sinfulness of man. Think about this. God has done everything in the world to get the attention of mankind. He has sent his own son to die on a cross. And so even as God now is punishing them for their sins, they still persist in their sins. They will not repent. And so it says here, the rest of the people who were not killed by these plagues did not repent. So the rest of the people clearly, as John tells us, are those who did not die. They did not repent. They would not worship the works of God's hands. They did worship the work of their own hands, the, the work of idols. And so they did not repent the works of their hands to stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, wood, which cannot see her walk. Idolatry and demon worship go hand in hand to worship stuff made of gold silver, brass, stone, or wood is really to worship Satan. It's not to worship the true God. So here are dead sinners worshiping dead gods. They cannot see, they cannot hear, they cannot walk. And demon gods they are, as we're told right here in verse 20. Verse 21 says, and they did not repent of their murders, their sorceries, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. Four additional sins are selectively listed in verse 21, in addition to idolatry, right? Perhaps these stand out in the last days. I think in these last days, we're definitely seeing murders. Uh, sexual morality is rampant, uh, thefts. Let me dive in a bit to sorceries here. Sorceries comes from a Greek word, uh, pharmakon. We get the word uh, you know, pharmaceutical, um, pharmacy, but it, it re uh, speaks about witchcraft, magic art, the use of drugs for divination or healing was part of a pagan false religion. And so there will be a rise in those things, and we are seeing a, a strange rise in Wicca and certain uh, weird uh, witchcraft sort of religions. And here in Orlando, I keep meeting people in Orlando that say, I'm a Wiccan, you know, and that's an interesting discussion. So that is a bit on the rise. You also have immorality. Uh, the Greek word there is pornea. Uh, we get the word pornography from this word in the Greek. Immorality just means all form of sexual sin. And I believe we are in a day and age where uh, sexual immorality is rampant and increasing and going to get worse and worse. These sins involve a basic violation of the Ten Commandments. You can read about the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 or Deuteronomy 5. Idolatry violates the first and second commandments. Murder violates the sixth. Immorality, the seventh. And thefts, the eighth. As in the days of the judges, it will be a time of unbridled evil with every man doing what is right in his own eyes. Such a day is coming, or is such a day already here? I think it is. I think we're looking at that uh, often. Let me give you some Old Testament connect connections here. I'm just gonna go through some of these. Um, you see a bunch of connections here to the, um, you know, the furnace opening up with sulfur, and then you have the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah there in Genesis 19, and also the top of Mount Sinai when the law was given. Uh, you have the locusts coming out that have a connection to the plague of Egypt. You can read about that there. Um, you also have a connection in Joel that we'll look at here in a minute. Um, let's look at this one. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any green tree, but only those people who do not have God's seal on their foreheads. In Ezekiel 9, you have a sealing of God's people in Jerusalem, passed through the city of Jerusalem, the Lord said to him, and put a mark. On the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the, det the detestable practices committed in it. May we never lose as Christians the heart to sigh and groan over the detestable sins of our day and age. Let's never, let's never accommodate to the culture, right? Um, in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. And you have Job 3.21, who wait for death, but it does not come. Search for it more than hidden treasure. This is the depression Job speaks of in Job 3, um, and you just have so many other verses that kind of speak to that that you can study. Um, let's look at the, the Joel passages, because I think these really correlate well to our study. The appearance of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle, something like golden crowns was on their heads, their faces were like human faces. 
Look at what Joel says in Joel 2, 4, and 5. Their appearance is like that of horses, and they gallop like war horses. They bound on the tops of the mountains. Their sound is like the sound of chariots, like the sound of fiery flames consuming stubble, like a mighty army de deployed for war. We have another bit of Joel here. For a nation has invaded my land, powerful and without number. Its teeth are like the teeth of a lion, has the fangs of a lioness. So you see the teeth of the lion uh, connecting there. Seems to be a lot of connections to what John saw and what Joel saw, as Joel wrote about the latter days. Look at Joel 2.5. They bound on the tops of the mountains. Their sound is like the sound of chariots, like the sound of fiery flames consuming stubble, like a mighty army deployed for war. We've seen that. So you just see the connections over and over. You've got a few more here where you've got, um, this is the altar being mentioned in Exodus 30 that we read in verse uh, 13, uh, where you can study that. Um, and then we're almost done with the whole thing. Uh, this this uh, page here speaks of the idols that cannot see, speak, or hear. And then finally, you've got Daniel saying a few things. Uh, let's look at Daniel's text in the middle. Daniel 5.23, and said, you've exalted yourself against the Lord of the heavens. The vessels from his house were brought to you, and you by your nobles, wives, and concubines drink wine from them. You praise the gods made of silver and gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which you not see or hear or understand, but you have not glorified the God who holds your life breath in his hand and who controls the whole course of your life. What a beautiful verse. And so we see uh, Deuteronomy at the bottom. They sacrificed to demons, not to God, to gods they had not known. New gods that had just arrived, which your ancestors did not fear. I want to warn you that in false religions, I believe demons are very involved in false religions and give people just enough to hook them into whatever it is they're doing. But every religion that's not of the one true God, that's not of Christ, is demonic and is leading people away uh, from God and, from, and into hell. Uh, key themes of Revelation 9, 1 through 11 the first trumpet, let's look at the key, key themes before I conclude. God's judgments will fall on those who rebel against him and persecute his people. People of God are sealed or protected against these demonic judgments. Praise God. They are God is sovereign over evil forces and can even allow evil to bring judgment upon evil. And then God limits his judgments. There's only a five-month period, right? And, and, and they don't kill. Uh, the locusts don't kill, desiring that the wicked will repent. Think about that for a moment. Why doesn't God wipe them out? Why does he give them five months? And why don't the locusts really kill? The army kills, but he's given them time to repent. He's desiring that the wicked will repent. So I think it's always important when we see the wrath of God, we look at his grace. We look at his extending grace to sinners. As we go to the other, um, the, the woe, the second woe, the sixth trumpet, God's judgments are just. And I want to say that again, God's judgments are just and right. The word just means yes and amen, that, that God in his nature, when he decrees and meets out justice and decrees a judgment, every, everyone on creation must say yes and amen. It's the right thing. He's the right judge. And we have to trust in his justness and judge is just judgment. As a form of judgment, God sometimes permits evil forces to turn on their own followers. And then human sinfulness leads to self-deception and self-destruction. We see that in those verses. Tragically, those hostile to God sometimes prefer idolatry and immorality to repentance. Uh, that is often the case where I've had people say, I don't want to be a Christian. I, I want to have fun. So let me give a conclusion here. And I think I misspelled conclusion. Or no, I didn't. Uh, it looks good. All right. Let's look here. Quote. Uh, I want to give you a quote from Grant Osborne's Commentary on Revelation. I love what he says here. Even the demonic forces can do nothing unless God allows it. Many have the mistaken opinion that Satan has autonomy from God and can do whatever he wishes. And that could not be further from the truth. Satan is powerless and is already lost at the cross. Everything he and his followers do in this book can only be done after God gives permission. Even more than that, all the actions of the evil forces are part of the divine will, thus part of the divine plan, as in God's control of the four horsemen of six, one through eight. However, God does not have to command the demonic locust to do anything. He simply allows their evil to express itself. And that's in uh, Osborne, Grant Osborne's commentary on Revelation, page 365. W.A. Criswell was a very famous pastor of 
First Baptist Church Dallas for over 50 years. Reflecting and writing on these very verses, he wisely noted this. One of the strange things about human nature is that man is not changed because of punishment. He may desist from evil because he is afraid, but his heart is still evil. He would do evil if he could get, a, get by with it. And a man is really changed only by the gospel of the grace of the Son of God. Our hope lies in the saving power of the gospel of Christ. And that is a, a test for you to test your heart. Uh, we all as Christians struggle with sin. We still desire sin in our, in our struggle. But in our heart of hearts, under the Lordship of Jesus, we, we uh, would wish for obedience and hope for obedience. And when we have that moment of conv conviction of sin, we repent and we turn to Christ and ask for healing and help. It's the genuine Christian that, that would not want to get away with evil if he could. It's the genuine Christian that wants to come clean and deal with his sin. And so let that be a test of your own heart tonight as you look at your heart. If you just can't wait to get somewhere in sin, and if you can get away with it, you would just love to do it and revel in that. That's a red flag. Um, that may be a temptation for any Christian, but, but no one can dwell in that sort of a mindset uh, at length and genuinely be a, a follower of Jesus Christ. One would think demons from the abyss and armies from the east would get humanity's attention. What an amazing reality it is that it does not. And may we, by God's grace, may we be different. You know, I hope for, for you that COVID has produced a sanctifying work in your life. I hope as we've gone through these months that your prayer life is, has been great. Uh, your, your devotional life has been good. Um, I hope you've grown in your ability to commune with the Lord. And so I'm going to um, open up the floor here for questions. And uh, I know in my life, whenever I face hardship, I've joked about this. I found myself sometimes confessing sins I've never committed because I just want to get everything clean between me and the Lord. And so uh, Christians, I think, you know, exactly. I'm speaking to the choir tonight. I know I am. You know that feeling, don't you? When you've sinned, you want to you want to go before the Lord and feel that cleansing uh, grace from him and forgiveness and mercy. Anyone have any questions about the, the text? And I know there may be some that are like, man, I don't see it all as demonic. I think maybe those were actual angels or the army was something else. So any questions, comments, uh, anyone have anything they want to ask at this time, feel free to, to ask away. Well, I would take a shot. Yeah. Go for it. Mike. Brandon go first this time. Yeah. I was just curious. Uh, this is the first time I've seen the timings of everything. So all the the seal judgment, the judgment, this is the first time I've seen five months for torment for the one, but even the sixth trumpet, it doesn't give a time on how long it takes to kill a third of the, is there anything on that? No, it seems to be pretty immediate, Brandon, after like the end of the five months, it's like, here's the army. You think, you think you've enjoyed five months? Well, hey, hey here's the next thing for you. Um, I mean, I don't know. It, it seems to be pretty swift. You know, when you got lions' uh, faces on horses, it's not going to be a slow thing, you know? So, <laughs> uh, that's a great question, though. I, I love the, uh, the focus of the grace of God in it, though. I think he's really giving them time to repent if they would, but they, they don't repent. Um, and so, uh, Mike, I think you had the next question, then we'll go with Gail after you. Okay, yeah, I was just intrigued by the four angels found at the Great River Euphrates. And, and again, in my mind, trying to discern whether those are uh, good angels or, or demons, uh, it kind of reminded me of Exodus 12 and the Passover, where the Lord uh, told them that if they do the things of the Passover, that the destroyer would not come in and destroy. And so it would seem that there was, there was some angelic being that God used to kill the firstborn in Egypt. And so this may be very similar. In you, nature. You, got, you got the 185,000 Assyrians in the camp, you know, that get destroyed in one night by the destroyer. That's right. That's right. That is an excellent point, Mike. Um, no, I, I would not press that they are demons too hard or far. And, um, but I, I just know that, um, you know, it, I, I've seen it a lot in the studies I've done where it's like, yeah, people have leaned on to the demonic side. But uh, either way, it's bad news, right, for, for those dwelling. I was wondering about the Great River Euphrates. Would that not be connected to ancient Babylon? It could very well be. Um, you have later in Revelation where the Euphrates dries up. And uh, I remember when I went on my mission trip to uh, Turkey many years ago, 
um, it came out in the paper there uh, that, that they had set up their dam structure, the system of dams all throughout Turkey, where on that trip and in the paper, they were admitting in the paper, had they wanted to do so, they could dry up the entire river Euphrates for the nation's south. And so a pastor was on the trip that said, Eureka, you know, Bible prophecy is being fulfilled on our very trip. And, and he's actually, I think there's truth to that, um, where now they are, they are exacting tribute from Syria and all the nations beneath them, where if they don't pay up, they're going to shut down the water. And it's, hmm. Turkey's getting a lot of money, but also getting in the hot water a bit with all that. So I think, though, the old Babylon coming back, yeah, it, it definitely is getting there. Um, Babylon the Great is, is forthcoming. And so we'll, we'll be studying all of that here in just a few weeks. So very good question. I see, Gail, you have your hand up, and then Sig will come to you after Stacy. Gail. Um, I had read once that they were saying that the Euphrates River flowed from the Garden of Eden. Well, in, in Genesis, oh. yeah, in Genesis, the original um, Euphrates did flow, uh, I think, from the garden. Is that right? And then you had the Tigris. Yeah. Tigris. And then it's hard to know post-flood, uh, you know, exactly where the, the new rivers are that, that we call the Euphrates. Um, so there's, oh, a bit of, yeah, there's a bit of, um, you know, uncertainty as to are these rivers today the exact rivers pre-flood that are mentioned in Eden. But yeah, you're correct, Miss Gale. Uh, also, I've often said that it have to be demonic spirits in people to make, you know, the, a child kill their parents while they're asleep or take a newborn baby and just, you know, murder a newborn baby and or just, you know, the massacres that they do. There have to be something evil within these people to do these acts. So. You know, I always, it has to be a demonic spirit. Yeah, it reminds me of Nazi Germany and, and the liquidation of the Jews, um, where, I mean, they were just getting drunk and, and uh, you know, seemed to be in a fit of rage, demonic rage, killing the Jewish people. Um, so I would agree. I, I know demons are involved, whether it's humans or demons alone, uh, ways to be seen, demon-possessed people. But, um, you know, I, I think we all agree demons are somewhere involved in it uh, as we read this chapter. I'm going to go to Stacy and then Sig, and then we're we're going to be out of time after that. Stacy, did you have a question? You have your hand raised. Yes, um, just a basic question. It's more like um, your viewpoint. I've read this chapter and I've reread it. This chapter alone was so descriptive. I mean, down to the writers, down to time frames, down to what the actual writers were on. Why do you think that was done? I just wanted to know your view on that. I mean, it seems so specific. I mean, descriptive. I, I, I think it goes back to God, you know, calling people to repent. You, you have a lot of folks that will read Revelation that are not Christians. Um, and I think I think as things may unfold, his word is going to stand. The grass withers, the flower, flower fades, his word stands forever. People are going to have access to his word, I think, during these days, um, where I think it's just going to, it's going to be so clear. Either you have to believe in God or you're in deep trouble. Um, right. But um, I would say to you, as, as clear as his descriptions are, this is one of the hardest chapters in all of Revelation to actually interpret. It um, was. And so, you know, working through the commentaries, there was so much diversity on things and and so picking a side, uh, and I, I want to be humble on that, like I've been, and just say, I may be off uh, a bit, but I think we're getting the big brush strokes, right, as we go through this chapter pretty well, um, True. Of what, what's going to unfold. So whether it's going to, you know, how many of you have ever heard the, the helicopter theory about the locust? Have you all ever heard that one and seen that? Yeah. So a lot of yeah. guys on TV. I've never heard that one. Yeah. And the tank, you know, I've heard that. We, I've grown up with it. You can't rule it out. You, you know, you honestly, in a way, I, I see it as a minority view, I think, from the text. Right. And, and there's a part of me as a kid that remembers reading that and, and seeing that as a kid going, man, that's cool. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, it seems to be sort of a minority uh, view on things. Right. So thank you so much, though, Stacey, uh, for hanging in. Um, yep. Yep. Uh, Sig Nephew, you got the last one, and then we'll, we'll sign out. We'll, well, you know, uh, 
uh, in some pictures, you almost think that maybe these are motorcycles, you know, with headlights and all this sort of stuff. Uh, uh, my, has anybody ever been stung by a scorpion? Franny did when we first came to Florida. She went out in the backyard and she got stung between her toes and it swole up and it was so, I had to take her to the hospital right away. Oh, that's the stuff of nightmares. Um, and then uh, uh, God certainly used the devil to, um, to do harm to Job. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, God can use anything and anybody. There's a very fascinating chapter in the book Systematic Theology by Wayne Grudem, and it's God's allowing of evil. It's one of the most interesting chapters. It's irrefutable as you study scripture. He allowed uh, Pharaoh's heart to be hardened, you know, all of these different things to so that his glory would shine brighter in some way. It, it's a bit mysterious, but he allows evil for his uh, purposes. He, and yet he, he does not commit evil. God doesn't do that, but he allows people to do and commit the evil that's in their own hearts. It's Romans 1. He hands them over to a reprobate mind. Right. to do the detestable acts that they love to do and want to do. And, and I think it's his restraining grace in us that keeps us, uh, even when we aren't Christian, to, you know, from doing the worst uh, that we desire to do as a people. Uh, thank you all. Um, the sad note at the end is still the sad reality. I think that we're seeing more and more, and that is an unrepentant mass, an unrepentant nation and world that no matter what unfolds, they refuse to come to the Lord Jesus. And so I think when we see that, as we still see it, we're in the longest time of our history in America without seeing a great revival. Uh, this is the longest uh, we've ever gone without something, and it may not come. Um, but we do know, right, that one chapter was at chapter six, where the, the multitude no one can number. We know the greatest revival is coming, and so um, it will happen one day, um, and, and more people will come to faith than have ever come. I thank you all for tuning in and being a part of this. Uh, we're going to continue journeying through. Uh, let me close in prayer, and then we'll sign off. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, let me pray, and then we'll, we'll head on. Lord, thank you for our study. Give us understanding of your word. Help us to absorb well what we're reading. And bless us as we depart, Lord. Give us grace, strength, and joy in our obedience to Jesus. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you all. I'm going to